Well, good morning, and I hope that this week you had a really good Thanksgiving. Uh, we had a chance to uh, host Thanksgiving this week over at our house, and, and we had a really good time. This has been a great week other than yesterday, which was just, just a, um, uh, you know, it's a sore point for, um, for many of us Duck fans, but um, the holidays, um, like Christmas and Thanksgiving, uh, there's something that is guaranteed to happen um, every year. You can almost plan on this happening. And you know what other things that you can plan on happening almost every year? Cold and flu. Cold and flu. And I don't know about you, but this season, this year, uh, it seemed like so many people have been hit with um, with colds, with flus, and it's interrupted a lot of people's Thanksgiving uh, plans and gatherings. Uh, well, this weekend I had uh, Caleb, our associate pastor, scheduled to preach today, and he ended up catching, I, I think, the flu, and so uh, he called me yesterday and asked if I could fill in for him, and I was happy just to, to come in and, and help and, and preach again uh, as, at he is home at, as he is at home recovering. And so if you could be praying for him, uh, I know he also has a busy week as well. Uh, so today, if you don't mind, um, we're going to take a break from the book of Philippians, and we're going to focus on a prayer from Paul in his letter to the Ephesians. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, um, let's just read the scripture together. Uh, it is a doxology out of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, uh, and we'll read this uh, together. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Uh, join me in prayer. Father, as, as we come to your word, we don't want to come in a, a kind of a lackadaisical um, uh, mindset, Father, that we take you for granted and then we miss the bigness and the goodness of you. Father, we ask that as we um, dig into your word, um, Paul's prayer here, that you would speak to us, open up our hearts, our minds. We want to lift up everyone who is just kind of battling a, a sickness right now and, and think of Caleb and just ask that you would, uh, you would allow a speedy recovery and uh, just a good uh, amount of rest. Uh, Father, we ask that you would speak and that you would use this time for your kingdom and for your glory alone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may go ahead and have a seat. Uh, every year, I would sit down with a marker and I would have a magazine. And I would open this magazine because, you know, my parents would always ask me, hey, what do you want for Christmas? And, and so what I would do is as I would thumb through the pages, I, I would find the things that I wanted and then, and then I would circle it in the magazine. And, and the things that I, I really, really wanted, I would make sure there was more circles around those items. And I would one circle, two circles, three circles. And, and what, what I wanted to communicate to my parents was that these items with the three, four circles on it, they have moved from a, um, from a desire to a need. Like, I have to have this. This is an absolute necessity. And, and on, on I would go with the magazines. And so finally, I would finish my investigation of what I would want and I would hand this to my parents and give this to them and I would say here is what I want for Christmas. Today my selection process is a little bit different when it comes to Christmas. Uh, it's a little bit more hands-on. Oftentimes what I like to do is I like to go through the grocery stores with my phone. I would see something and I would snap a picture and what I, would no what I now do is I would go and look it up on Amazon and buy it from Amazon in instead of the stores. Now, if you were to uh, ask my wife, is it easy to buy a Christmas gift for me? Uh, she would say, absolutely easy. I'm just kidding. Uh, she's shaking her head over there at me. She would say, it's actually really difficult because I'm, I'm very indecisive. And uh, I don't really give her a lot to kind of go off of. I just say, I don't know, give me a book or something. But do you know what I find? You know who I find it hardest to buy a gift for? People you hardly know. People you hardly know. I, have you ever had to buy a gift for somebody that you hardly know? I mean, it's tough, is it not? So what do you do? 
Well, chances are likely that you do some investigating uh, on who this person is, on what they like. Maybe, maybe you start talking to their friends, their family members, their kids. You, you kind of go through their social media profile trying to figure out what exactly does this person like? What do they do? What do they enjoy? And then you try to figure out the right gift for them. And, and that kind of approach, it just makes sense, right? If you're going to buy a gift for somebody that you hardly know, you should figure out what they want before you go and you buy it. But you know what's funny? When it comes to things like prayer, most people assume they know what God wants them to pray, but they don't actually do any investigating on what the things that God actually wants us to be praying for. So what things do, does God want us to pray? What, what prayers does God enjoy answering? For so many people, prayer is seen as this sort of gift transaction like Santa Claus, right? You give him him your list and he checks it twice to see if you've been naughty or nice and he gives you accordingly. And we come to God and we tell him, we tell him what we want and what we would like him to do for us. But do we ever stop and ask, God, what do you want me to be praying for? What do you want me to be praying for? I mean, is it possible that a lot of times we are come to God bringing to him things that are actually foreign to, to what he wants to do in our lives simply because we don't know what he wants? Well, let me ask you this question. If you had five minutes alone with God, five minutes alone with God where you can um, each compare notes of the things that God wanted to do in your life. And that was his list. And on your list, it's the things that you are praying for right now. Would those lists look alike? Or would they look very different? I think it's a difficult question to answer because a lot of times we don't really have a clear understanding of what God wants us to be praying for. We could, we could have all kinds of hypothetical situations and requests that to us they seem right, but without a clear understanding from God, we're, we're left a little bit in the dark when it comes to prayer. And in Ephesians chapter 3, the passage we just read out loud, Paul gives us a picture of the prayers that God enjoys answering. But before we can um, really unpack those points, uh, there's something that we have to uh, first talk about. It, it's something that I think a lot of people um, believe to be true, but don't really believe it for themselves. Now, all over the Gospels, that's the biographies of Jesus, we find Jesus saying to his followers, ask anything in my name, and I will give that to you. Now, here's one example, John 14. Whatever you ask in my name, This I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And and a lot of people um, think that Jesus, uh, a lot of people operate with the assumption that Jesus is kind of giving us a formula for how to end our prayers. Like, as if Jesus was saying, hey guys, when you pray, make sure that you end your prayers by saying, in my name, amen, otherwise this is nullified, this isn't going to (laughs) count. As a brand new Christian, this was really confusing for me. I imagined prayer was a lot like having a conversation um, with God on the phone, and that the way that you hung up the phone was by saying, in Jesus' name, amen, like this is how I'm ending our conversation. And what freaked me out was, um, if you'd never said that, it was like you took your phone and you put it on the dresser, and God heard everything else after that moment, which was totally terrifying as a new believer. I mean, there were so many times where I forgot to hang up the phone on God. And then it hit me much later in the day that I never said in Jesus' name, amen. And I had a panic moment. And I, I started thinking, oh no, what did, what, did I, what did I say? Like, what did God overhear me saying? And so I would discreetly just close my eyes, bow my head and say, Lord, I have no idea what I said, but please forgive me for that. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> when Jesus tells us to pray, for things in his name, he's not giving us instructions for how to end our prayer. He's, instead, he's giving us a focus and a purpose for our prayer. Uh, here's what's interesting. In the ancient world, names uh, were not just about the identity of a person. Um, they were also, they, they stood for the reputation of a person. 
Uh, So when Jesus says, ask anything in my name, he is telling us to ask for things that are all about Jesus' reputation. The things that Jesus was known for on earth are the very things that we should be praying for. That we should be praying for things that are in alignment to Jesus, in agreement with what Jesus was known for, what Jesus stood for, with what Jesus taught about, with what Jesus himself desires. And God answers those prayers. This is what it means to pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, John put it this way in one of his letters, 1 John chapter 5. And this is the confidence that we have toward him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. John cuts right to the heart with this in Jesus' name business and what that's all about. It's not about me adding in Jesus' name, amen, to all of my prayers, but rather it's letting my prayers be shaped by God's very own will, which is all about his kingdom. It is all about God's kingdom. And this brings us to, I think, kind of the key idea behind this passage. The the prayers that God enjoys answering are kingdom prayers. They're kingdom prayers. They are prayers that are driven for asking for kingdom-driven things. And Jesus promises us that when we ask for God's will to be done on earth, right, kingdom-driven prayers, those are the very prayers that not only God answers, but that God enjoys answering. I mean, it's it's like when you have kids. And you're, you, you, know, you, you train your kids, you try to teach your kids, and one of the things that you want your kids to learn is you want your kids to learn how to talk. And so where do you begin? You begin by teaching them, by saying, okay, mom, dad, mom, dad. And you say this over and over and over and over again. And finally the moment comes when your kids say, you know, uh, mama or dada, and your heart fills with joy and excitement because your kids are finally starting to grasp what you're teaching them. And in the same way with God, right? God doesn't mind us coming to him with all kinds of requests and prayers. In fact, scripture says, bring all of your, bring all of your requests to God. But he does want us, um, he, he does want our hearts, our minds to be in alignment with the things that he is passionate about, the things that he wants to see done. And so he, he gives us his word that is to guide us, it's to, it's to, um, uh, to uh, align us, to, to grow us, to shape us so that we begin praying and thinking and pursuing things that are about his kingdom, the things that he wants us to do, the things that he came to do. And John says that when we can be so confident that when we are asking for God to do things in alignment to his will, his kingdom, we, those prayers, they have already been answered when we ask them. So let me ask you a question. Do you actually believe that? Do you believe that? Do you actually believe that Jesus meant what he said? Do you believe that God will answer your prayers when you ask for Jesus-centered, Jesus-focused things? See, I think a lot of people were plagued with pessimism and skepticism, are we not? We've been beat up, we've been disappointed by by life, we we have a string of unanswered prayers, and and we struggle to believe that, that anything could be too good to be true. And so we take Jesus' words maybe as insightful, as encouraging, uh, but deep down I don't think we really buy what Jesus says. But what if we did? What if what Jesus said was true? (laughs) Novel idea, I know, but what if if it was true? What if if Jesus actually meant what he said? (laughs) What if when Jesus tells us, knock down the doors of heaven with your request for God to move in our world, God says, yes, I've been waiting for you to ask me to do that. And what if God invites us to pray for kingdom-driven things? What if he was more eager to answer our prayers than we were to ask them? For me, I have two questions that pop into my mind that maybe you do too. The first one is, what in the world is the kingdom? 
And when we talk about the kingdom, what is the kingdom? And the second question is, what does it look like to have kingdom prayers? So let's start with the first one. What, in, what is the kingdom? Uh, the word in the New Testament of the kingdom of God, uh, it's, it's a very common theme all throughout Scripture. In fact, it comes up over a hundred different times uh, in the New Testament, and a lot of times this is on the lips of Jesus, right? Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of God. And if you're curious and you want to do your own research on this, um, I would encourage you to open up the book of Matthew and just read the book of Matthew, take a note of the different times that Jesus talks about the kingdom of God. This would be a good December study for you if you're looking for something to read. But the simple understanding of the kingdom of God is this. The kingdom of God is all about God's rule. It's all about God's authority. It's all about Jesus being king. And so here's um, the, the idea, the simplest idea that I can put to this. That the kingdom of God is God's rule on earth as it is in heaven. That is God ruling on earth as it is in heaven. That God's rule is cosmic. It includes all creation, all every, every possible square inch of um, life and existence is ruled by God. Which is fascinating because do you remember what Jesus taught his disciples about how to pray? We just read this this, this morning as Andrew uh, led us in communion. Here's what Jesus says. Let me read this again. Matthew 6, verse 9 and 10. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom is about God taking his rightful place in our lives and in the world. The kingdom of God is us living our lives in complete surrender to God's rule over our life, his rule over heaven and earth. And if, and if you think about it, this is like the key distinguishing feature between heaven and earth. Like, what is it that makes earth so different from heaven? It's that everyone in heaven, they know who really is in charge. And here we just kind of go, I, I don't know. And in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul gives us three truths that are absolutely central to aligning our prayers to being kingdom-focused, kingdom-driven. The first truth about prayer, about kingdom-driven prayers, is that the kingdom is all about God and not about me. The kingdom is all about God, not me. Uh, here's, here's what he says in uh, uh, verse 20 and at the beginning of 21. He says, now to him... God. And then on in verse 21, it says, to him be glory. A, a lot of times we, um, we pray thinking that prayer is about us um, getting what we want or, or telling God what we would want him to do, but it's not. At least it shouldn't be about that, right? I mean, ultimately our, our prayers should mature to, to be more focused on God. Uh, prayer is not about me, it is about God. And instead of asking, um, what do I want? We should be instead asking, God, what do you want? What do, you want for my, what do you want for my life? What do, you, what do you want for my marriage? What do you want for my kids? What do you want? Why did you place me here in this job? What do you want in my retirement? And when we begin with me, we mistake God's will for my will. But when we begin with God, God's will, it becomes our will. It becomes our desire. And in the process of seeking God's will, we find that all of our greatest desires, wants, hopes are satisfied. And maybe for you, you're running on empty. You're running on empty. And you're looking for the perfect thing that will just satisfy, that will fulfill, that will give you the longing of your heart, that you hope that you will find satisfaction maybe in a relationship. Maybe it's with a spouse, a um, somebody you're dating, maybe it's even in your kids or coworkers. You're, you're hoping it's some sort of satisfaction. Maybe it's satisfaction in retirement or a paycheck getting a raise this next season, but you fear that those are going to leave you unsatisfied with your life and you're going to have to find something else. Maybe you're here this morning because you know, you've been chasing after something that can only be found in God. God is the only one who can truly meet your deepest needs and hopes. And everything else you strive for will in the end leave you feeling emptier. Our lives, our prayers have to begin with God. 
That's why Paul says, now to him. <laughs> it has to be God focused. So what does God want? Well, this leads us to our second point in this passage. Paul reminds us about God's kingdom, and that is it's greater, it's greater than me. It's greater than my desires, it's greater than my wants, it's greater than my hopes. God's kingdom is so much greater than us. And Paul says that God's ability and power is infinitely greater than anything that we could possibly imagine, and that there is nothing, there is nothing that stands in God's way of accomplishing that. God is not limited in his power and his ability, even when we cannot see it. Even when we cannot see God working in a situation, God is not limited by that. He's not limited by our perspective. And oftentimes, you know, we think um, that God is only going to do something if we ask it. That's not true. Or that somehow when we show up, now God can begin working in this person's life but God is greater than our hopes God is greater than our dreams God is greater than our prayers we might wonder from time to time where was God when this happened where was God when when I got this diagnosis but just because we cannot see him or we cannot see any good coming out of a situation does not mean that God is limited by our limits Far from it, Paul says, verse 20, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. The work that God does in our lives is through his spirit operating behind the scenes. And a lot of times, we don't see that. So what is that work? What is that work that God does through his church? Here's what Paul, Paul gives us kind of the, the third point on God's kingdom. Look at this. Verse 21. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So what's the point? Here's the point. The kingdom is for the next generation. The kingdom is for the next generation. Yes, it's for our generation, but it's also for the next generation. He, he says that, that God is to be praised in the church and in Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And here's what this means. The glory that is due to God is in the church. That is the people who have surrendered their lives to let Christ rule as the king of their life, right? Christ, you're in charge. You, uh, you tell me what you want me to do, right? As people surrender to God's will, um, that, that um, God's glory is evident in that. So um, how does that look in the church? It is by making known to other people the gospel. It is bringing the truth of Jesus to bear on our relationship. The prayer is that, that we would be, um, that there would be more disciples of Jesus made as a result of us making Jesus known. And here's the clincher. It is to be, it, it is to be throughout all generations forever and ever. What this is saying is that God is to be praised. Um, it, it's to go on from one generation to the next generation, to the next generation, until God decides that he's going to wrap up time with eternity. And the implication is this, that God's kingdom is that each generation would lead the next generation to praising God's glory in the church. That it is each generation's responsibility to lead the next generation to praising God. And I don't know about you, but it, it is easy to look at the successes of the past and then feel frustrated at the struggles that we face presently, right? It's easy to look back and go, man, it was so much easier then. Look at all the things that God has done back then. We can look at the early church in, in the book of Acts and we can see there are tons of people, hundreds and thousands of people giving their lives to Christ. Look at how God worked then. Uh, look at the early founding of our country and the, the fact that, that we began with, with a free country that we can, we can choose to follow and have a relationship with Jesus. Look at all the things that God has done. Look at 40, 50 years ago at all of the revivals that were taking place in our country and beyond that. And we can look around today and, and look at this, this next generation and even part of our own generation and we could get frustrated. 
We can, we, can, we can fall into kind of this Adam mindset and just start blaming <laughs> for, for why people don't do this or why they do do that. Or, or we can do what Paul tells us in his, in his prayer and we can lead this next generation somewhere different. Lead our generation somewhere different. Lead them to praising the glory of God in the church. A few weeks ago, uh, we got together with 17 other Gresham pastors just to encourage each other, get to know each other, and to pray for each other in our ministries. And for nearly all of these churches, um, I think almost every church is in this sort of new rebuilding kind of season. Uh, after In this, this new uh, season of life that we're in, new season of ministry. And for most of them, um, and this is true across the country, most of the churches that have have seen about a quarter of the former churches, uh, church attenders uh, just straight up disappear. Like they just got raptured. And so here we are, we're all left here. So it's really strange. It's really somewhat discouraging to, to see this happen. And this is true just across the board with all kinds of pastors. Everybody's scratching their head going, where did, where did they go? And, and I suspect that there's going to be a really unique challenge facing the big C church here in America in this next season. Where it's not just we're facing, you know, maybe people just deciding not to come or people being a little bit um, timid or fearful or, or whatever the reason may be. But I think we're facing a really unique challenge with um, Christians by and large coming to God not just with a different list of prayers, a different list of requests, but a completely different list of what it means to be Christian altogether. than what God has. I think, I think we really face a pivotal moment in our time where it's, who, who gets to define what Christianity means? Who, who gets to define what it means to, to follow Jesus? And I'm not saying that if, 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 if you're at home or whatever, that, that you're redefining Christianity, but I think we are in a really unique moment of time where, where there is this sense of like, who, who is defining what it means to follow Jesus? And what happens, just throwing this out there, but what happens if as Christians that, that we come to God with, with, with our own magazines of, of the things that we want him to do and, and we, we go to him and we, we've circled this item, we've double circled this one and we triple circled this one and, and we ask God, hey God, I want you to answer these prayers. Hey God, this is what it means for me to follow you. And God goes, I, I don't know what book that is, but that's not my book. These aren't the things that I want you to prioritize. And, and then maybe, you know, when we, we come to God with our own uh, agenda, our own perspective, and, and we don't have our prayers answered, we don't God have um, God blessing the lives that we would like to live, we get frustrated and we wonder, why is God not answering my prayers? Why is God not honoring the lifestyle that I want to live? I'm, I'm reading a book, and I, I, I want to share this um, brief story, but it's about digging into the Word and uh, in, in this story, this, uh, this pastor has a, uh, is discipling this young man who comes to faith in Christ, and he is thriving. He is reading chapters upon chapters. I think it was like 17 chapters or something like that a day. Just, just diving in, learning a lot. And then all of a sudden, out of the middle of nowhere, he just stops reading. All contact with the pastor just ends. He's not reading the Bible anymore. And so he finally gets the chance to sit down and talk with him, going, what's going on with your life? And here's his response. He says, as I've been reading my Bible, I keep coming across passages that, that point out things that I'm doing that are wrong. I feel bad when I read these parts of the Bible. I don't want uh, I, I to stop doing these things. I enjoy them. I also keep reading passages that tell me to do stuff that I just don't want to start doing. So I stopped reading my Bible. I think a lot of fe people feel that way. Uh, in Sunday school, we talked about repentance. And, you know, it's all of life is repentance. All of life is just coming to grips with the reality that, that we do have a condition that we need constantly to come to our Savior. We need His grace daily. But, but things are not always, uh, are not all bad. Things are not all hopeless. 
because on the heels of this season that we have come out of as a church, we have seen tons of people just across the churches, and these were stories that we were filling the room with of people who never dreamed of going to church, never dreamed of believing in God, all of a sudden showing up to church because they realized they needed something different in their life. They needed something better. They needed something new. They needed hope. And to me, this tension, when people come to the moment where they realize that the way that life is going, it's just not working for them, to me, this is a great opportunity and a great challenge for the church. It's an opportunity because I think God allows us to experience a little bit of dissatisfaction in our life to highlight the fact that there is something really important that is missing in our lives. We are missing God. We need God. And and if that's you, that's my answer. If you are trying to operate in your own power, in your own strength to accomplish whatever you want to accomplish and you feel like there's something missing, it could be that you're missing Jesus. But it's also a unique challenge for churches because every generation carries the responsibility of leading the next one to praising God's glory. And when we do that, when we take that responsibility to heart, it reshapes everything about us. It reshapes how we live. It, oftentimes it reshapes what churches look like. It reshapes how we spend our time. It even reshapes the things that we pray for. And the question that we all must wrestle with is this. Are we leading those in the next generation around us to praise Jesus, or are we just expecting them to figure that out for themselves? Paul says the kingdom is for the next generation praising God and for that generation to lead the next generation and for that generation to lead the next generation to praise God until Jesus returns. A while back I I read a book that said said this and as a pastor this hit me right in my heart and it has never left my brain. So maybe it's something for me just to to hang on to and pay close attention to but this this is what I read. It says, oftentimes the message that we are sending is this, that if you want to to embrace the Christian faith, you need to find another church. My church is designed primarily to be meaningful for me, not to reach you. And boy, that's a gut check for me. How many of us wouldn't want to do everything we possibly could to see our kids, to see our grandkids, to to fall deeply in love with Jesus. This is my prayer. This is our prayer every single night. May, May our kids grow up to love Jesus with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Don't you feel that? What if Jesus is inviting us to have kingdom driven prayers, not simply to encourage us, but to challenge us because God actually wants to do something right here, right now, with your life. And what if God desires us to remember that it is all about his kingdom, not my kingdom? And what if God was more eager to lead this next generation to praising his glory through the church than a lot of times we are? And what if it all began with prayer? What if prayer was the thing that we, we needed to just bunker down and focus ourselves intensely on, is making sure that we are praying kingdom-driven prayers, even as we enter into this next season of Christmas? I'd like to invite the team forward. Would you join me in prayer? Father, as we, as we sit in um, the, the, the words that you, you gave Paul to pray back to you, Lord. We ask that you would help us. Um, God, there's, there's so many people that we, that we know that don't know you, God, that, that maybe in this time you've placed on our hearts that we should be praying for. And God, we lift them up to you. We ask that, that you would give a, a, a sense of dissatisfaction in the way that life is being run so that they can run in the right direction and that be to you. Father, we pray um, and we ask that you would give us as a church opportunities to share 
um, the truth of you, even if it's a small, um, a small part of who you are, or maybe it's just telling the full story of, of your gospel. God, we just ask that you would give us the opportunities to share Jesus, both in word and deed, with other people. God, that you would give us the courage to act and the determination to not give up in being faithful to that. Lord, help us this season um, just to be firmly rooted and to be completely focused on your kingdom and your kingdom alone. Father, may in our lives, may be true that you are in charge as you are in heaven. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. Uh, here in our moment, um, we're gonna have a time where we get to connect and uh, hang out, talk, have some treats, snacks, drinks, uh, and just a good time just to connect with one another. And this is, this is a great opportunity. If you're a guest, we would love to get to know you. We would love to talk with you. Um, we're available walking around, and we'd just love just to hear your story, hear who you are, um, maybe what drew you to uh, Cornerstone. Also, there's a, um, as Sam said it, there's food over there, Sam. And um, uh, I'm the, I'm the, the, the turkey, uh, although smoked turkey is my favorite. I just have to say... Um, but, you know, one of the things that um, is, it's, it's kind of a, uh, I guess a bold thing to say is that God answers kingdom-driven prayers, and there's a part of me that, that feels this conflict. I don't know if you feel this, I, I feel this confliction there of what about the prayers that God doesn't answer? Well, the truth is God answers. But it, he may not answer the way that we want him to answer, but he does answer our prayers. Sometimes it's either one of three, uh, one of three answers. It may be yes, it may be no. And a lot of times in my experience, it's just, it's not yet. It's not yet. Uh, a few years ago, I think three, four years ago, um, God put this deep desire in my heart and in Stephanie's heart to come back to Gresham. And I couldn't quite figure it out. And, and I prayed a lot about it. I prayed a, a lot for that to come to pass. And I remember in 2020, I was just praying. Um, I just, there's a couple of moments where God just, just, I felt like he put this little nugget in my head that we are going to end up back in Gresham. And so I immediately was like, okay, God, open the door now. And his answer to me was not yet. And I think a lot of times the not yet is God's work in our own heart. And when we pray and we ask God to work, we have to also have the willingness to trust that he will do it in his own timing. And so as we do that, as we, as we go into this week, be bold in your kingdom prayers, but also be patient knowing that it's God who is at work and he is at work behind the scenes to orchestrate things to fit into um, the way that he wants things to fit together. And sometimes that, that takes us, sometimes that work is in us to be patient. So let me pray and then we can uh, um, enjoy just fellowship with one another and some, um, uh, some time uh, together over here with some drinks and snacks. Father, we thank you for your grace, your goodness, we thank you that you're not a God who is out into the distance, um, removed and uninvolved in our lives, but you are involved in every small detail of our life that at some point we can look back and we can see your hand involved even in the moments where we think you were the most absent from us. Father, give us the courage to, to pray for bold things to see you work in people's lives. But God, give us the courage, the bravery, the patience to be able to wait. And Father, help us to know, um, to, ha to have joy and rejoice in your answer, whatever the answer is, if it's a yes, no, or not yet. Father, we, um, we love you. We thank you so much for your plan. It is, it is perfect, it is flawless, and it is what we want in our lives, even if we cannot see it in the moment. Help us, Lord, to trust you as we, as we live our lives for you under your rule and reign. And uh, Jesus, we lift all of this up to you. Amen.